How's it going, you sexy beasts? With the Empire Specific Fighter and Infiltrator update just on the horizon of Planetside 2, I think it was time to uncover a little bit about what is going down on the test server. A few things to expect are the additions of new weapons for the Infiltrators, new weapons for ESFs, and the map for the first battle island, the Nexus. As usual, these are all tentative and are still subject to change at any point in time. As a matter of fact, the new ESF weapons have been pulled since the recording of this video, so don't quite have had any footage to show you guys. So, let's go ahead and jump in. The one aspect of Planet Side 2 that hasn't really been touched since release are the Empire-specific fighter jets. These things have been tearing up infantry since the dawn of time, but haven't been shown any love in regards to new content or any major changes. SOE is planning to change that with the ESF update coming down the road, which will bring a whole slew of changes. First and foremost, which I'm sure plenty of pilots are going to condemn, is the change to the reverse maneuver. In fact, it's a change to the analog throttle and the thrust produced by the afterburners. On live servers currently, pushing the analog throttle almost instantly halts any forward movement and allows for a quick turnaround on an enemy pursuant or easily maneuver around a rock outcropping to break hostile line of sight. The new change reduces forward movement slightly faster than the throttling down normally. Many, many pilots are going to be outraged by this change as it essentially lowers the skill ceiling. It's a heck of a change to experienced pilots, but many new players won't know the difference, but should see an increase in fighting potential against pilots who regularly use the reverse maneuver. Personally, I think Planetside 2's flight mechanics are so wonky and unique that removing that one aspect that makes them unique is just another step in the wrong direction. In regards to the reverse maneuver essentially being nerfed, the afterburner fuel tank certs line have been expanded and will allow pilots to dump certs into a longer afterburner duration as well as a faster burner regeneration. This will help chop up and add more diversity to pilots who may not want underwing weapons and prefer to further add to their maneuverability. So enough of that and on to the new weapons we'll be seeing. None of them are Empire specific as they are all part of the Nanite Systems branch of weaponry. The first of the three are the Locust Cannons and look to be the most badass. These are wing mounted chain guns that act just like the current iteration of the Terran's Vulcan minigun. It requires a slight spin up time to reach full rate of fire and has a ton of ammo to pour through its mini barrels. The next weapon we'll be seeing soon are the mass drivers which presumably are a very new conglomerate type weapon utilizing the miracles of magnets and however they work to prepare bullet bricks at the target with near instantaneous connections between firing and the projectile making contact with its target. The mass drivers come with a very very tiny magazine and a small ammunition reserve but greatly reward the use of accurate shots to take down targets. Final weapon we'll be seeing are the coyote missiles. These are air superiority lock-on missiles designed presumably for newer players who can't hit stuff with breaker pods or prefer to have the game auto-aim for them. I can't quite see a difference between these and the current air-to-air -air missiles available to the ESFs aside from the Coyote missiles coming with multiple missiles per magazine as opposed to just one missile loaded at a time. There's an obvious damage difference between the single air-to-air -air missile and the Coyotes, both require three magazines to drop an ESF. Not much else to say there. In their current iterations, all three new ESF weapons are pretty awesome and add variety to the air combat scene aside from rotary and rocket pods being the only setup to run. Can't wait to see these weapons being balanced a little bit more and to see how they fit into the combat scene of Planet Side 2. On to the much awaited infiltrator news, but sadly there's not a lot to talk about as I don't quite have information in regards to their update in particular. What I do have though is a screenshot of the new weapon that will be available to the infiltrator class exclusively and it looks pretty freaking badass. This weapon was showcased as a teaser in the latest episode of Command Center, which was episode number 16. The rifle model showcased features a few awesome aspects that help cut down the somewhat bland weapon design we've seen in the startering weapons available to each faction. In particular, we've got an adjustable skeletal stock, plenty of modular rail systems slap down the barrel housing and upper receiver, as well as a side-loaded magazine. Presumably the bolt is right below the upper receiver and looks pretty freaking big. I don't quite see a handle used to pull the bolt back between each shot, meaning this weapon could be designed for a southpaw shooter, or it's a semi-automatic weapon with a pretty awesome ejection animation for spent cartridges. 
In all honesty, this weapon could totally be mistaken as a Vanu weapon if it were painted purple instead of red. The sleek design looks absolutely awesome and can't wait to see what kind of blocky design the new conglomerate get. Oddly enough, the Drifter Jump Jets for the Light Assault have been given a slight buff to help bring them into the light of usefulness in far more situations. Initial fuel costs of the jets have been increased, prolonged jet use will consume less fuel, and the jets will now propel you slightly higher up than before upon usage. Rapidly tapping the jump, jump key will repeatedly give you that initial jump height boost, but at the cost of extra fuel consumption. This change will allow drifter jet users to actually scale walls and get up to higher places than before without having to use the default jump jets to gain a vertical advantage. If you're caught on the ledge of a rock, you'll now be able to spam your jump key to further lift yourself up and over the rock, as opposed to standing there and wishing you had the default jump jets. This is a pretty awesome change, as I'm sure plenty of light assault users will at least try them out, if not swap over to the drifters entirely. Flak Armor is getting an overall buff as well. As I'm sure we all know, Flak Armor provides a damage resistance against all explosives. As some may not know, explosive projectiles deal two types of damage. If someone shoots an underbarrel grenade launcher at you, and it detonates right on your soldier's chest, there's two types of damage dealt. First damage type that would be dealt is the impact damage, which is usually enough to kill you. The second damage type is the actual explosive itself, which Flak Armor will protect you from. In its current implementation, Flak Armor will provide no protection if you are hit directly with an underbarrel grenade, an RPG, or an ESF's rocket pods. Meaning if those hit your character directly, rather than just exploding near you, you'll essentially take double the damage. This is a really, really big game changer and will make Flak Armor that much more effective. In an example with the max, say you're going to get hit from a decimator rocket. The initial rocket originally deals 2,000 damage with another 1,000 splash damage, which Flak Armor will only mitigate the splash damage. With this change, Flak Armor will both affect the numbers of the damage dealt and the impact damage, which will extremely increase survivability against explosives. As if the Flak change wasn't enough, the following max anti-vehicle weapons are going to be nerfed against infantry targets, which are the NC's Raven and Falcon, the TR's Fracture and Pounder, and the VS's Comet. The final biggest change that we can expect to see very soon are the changes and improvements to projectile physics in the game. One major bug that is currently associated with this aspect of the game is the Terran Republic Striker Rocket Launcher. After the locked-on vehicle has exited the render distance of the heavy who launched the rockets, the launched rockets become completely glitched out and will completely pass through terrain and hit their target. This odd bug comes into play due to air vehicles rendering at a much further distance than infantry. That heavy assault can easily see the aerial target in the sky and can lock onto it, but the pilot of the vehicle has no idea where the heavy assault is solely due to the rendering distances set. After the heavy fires the striker, the pilot still cannot see the projectile since it's being fired from an invisible person and is visually invisible to the pilot as well. Yep, the game still tracks it. The new projectiles are going to allow players to see fired projectiles at a much, much further range than before. This new system will fix the major striker bug, fix the AV mana turrets rockets from appearing past infantry render distances, and prevent the Phoenix camera guided rockets from doing wonky stuff to other clients. As for the final bits to look forward to, we've got some quality of life upgrades, the Nexus Battle Island map, and more very awesome Player Studio stuff. The first bit is the addition of the very, very badass exhaust stacks for the Sunder. These mount onto the rear of the Sunder and produce exhaust while you're driving your badass Sunder, coupled with badass animations and particles to boot. This, as well as the new chrome and gold-plated luggage rack, mount onto the new cosmetic slot added for the Sunder, titled Other. A few other vehicle cosmetic pieces will be hitting the depot soon, such as the chrome and gold windshields for the harasser and the empire specific luma fiber colors for the lightning. We can expect to see more player studio content getting into the game with each and every patch as more badass players are submitting their content. A couple bits to mention are the black flames camo pattern available to all factions as well as these very badass looking Terran Republic helmet. Vanu and Conglomerate players will more than likely be getting a helmet of their own as well, but both are way off in the distance to be shown right now. As always, Nanite Systems wants to produce the same stuff that everyone else is, and has a helmet designed with their own touch to it. As for the Nexus Battle Island, we've got the map revealed to us, and holy crap does it look awesome! 
I don't know every single aspect of this, and it could be completely different once we actually get our hands on it, but for now, it shows off the nine total capture points on the map. These include the first outpost right outside each team's warp gate, the top lane outpost on each team's side of the map toward the east, converging to a larger facility. The bottom lane with two very small outposts that meet in the middle at a medium outpost. All of these capture points circle around the giant crater in the middle of the map that houses another capture point, which is built to be infantry only. The Nexus looks entirely awesome and I can't wait to see it in game. What are your thoughts about it? Can't wait to see it in game or are you going to avoid it entirely? Let me know in the comment section below. So there you have it you sexy beasts. Some up and coming content for Planet Side 2, which most of it should be reaching live servers in about a week and a half from now. That is, if everything goes according to plan. What all are you most excited to see? Battle Islands and the new sexy sniper rifle for infiltrators looks amazing, and I can't wait to get my hands on them. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this little sneak peek video, and if you did, please give it a big ass thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs it down and let me know what I can improve upon. Want to see more videos like this? Go ahead and subscribe, it's free.